I'd like to welcome all of you here today, as well as to our distinguished panelists. You'll notice that we currently have three people up here, in addition to myself. There should be four, four panelists. Unfortunately, um, one of the panelists has had an accident uh, yesterday, so he's currently at the hospital, and he is, uh, is very brave and very optimistic, and he will try to join us for the end of the session. So we'll, we'll wait and see if, uh, if he's able to make it. If it is just the three panelists, then we should have more than enough time for questions at the end. So I would, uh, I would encourage you to, to make mental note or to jot down the questions you'd like. And we will hold them till the end and then do several rounds with the panelists. So again, I'm pleased to welcome you here today uh, to the panel number six on integrating adaptation and mitigation actions. And my name is Reagan Suzuki, and I work with RECOFT, the Center for People in Forests, and I am the coordinator of RedNet, which is a civil society-based project, um, which emphasizes the sharing of information and knowledge uh, within the region around RED, uh, reducing emissions from deforestation and uh, uh, forest degradation. So my area of work is more along the lines of mitigation. And I personally think this is a very important subject. And this is, in my opinion, a very important panel in trying to identify what the linkages are between adaptation and mitigation. And while historically, I think the two, the two issues, the two approaches have been dealt with separately, we're starting to see at least at the international level uh, a recognition that they need to be merged. And at the, the most recent COP in Durban, there was a proposal from Bolivia to establish a joint mechanism for adaptation and mitigation. And uh, this has been accepted. So while there are those developments at the international level, to date, I think we still have relatively little in terms of documentation of ground level, project level, integration of adaptation and mitigation. So with that, I will not take up too much more of your time, <coughs> but I am pleased to present the first of our <coughs> panelists. Um, and while you have the detailed biographies, I will just say briefly, Mr. Fawad Khan is a senior associate with the Institute for Social and Environmental Transition, ISET, and he's based in Pakistan. First of all, thank you for having me. And uh, my presentation uh, today is uh, something that we came across our research. Uh, and I actually started off with disaster risk reduction uh, for earthquakes and not even, uh, not even you know, adaptation and medication to sort of climatic changes. Um, the earthquake in Pakistan in 2005 left a whole lot of people homeless, and some people uh, tried to address that issue and came up with a new building technique that was very cheap, uh, affordable for the poor people and also uh, uh, it, it did not require many materials to be brought from the outside in the mountain areas. And uh, the, the technology they used was a very old one. Uh, it's called st straw bale construction. And just to explain what straw bale is, you basically <coughs> take straw like rice and compress it. Uh, into bales or large bricks and uh, that is actually done for storing straw over a long season so all the air goes out and the straw doesn't go bad but a couple of hundred years back some people started using it as building blocks and the beauty of straw is that it's a bit flexible so in an earthquake it would not fall down like uh, concrete and uh, brick structures do so if you move on from there so we took this and uh, we thought this would be very useful to be used in Kathmandu because uh, Kathmandu has a, it's, is in a very peculiar place. Um, 
Nepal, because of its geography and uh, socio-economic condition, is a very vulnerable place to climate change. It also has a very high risk of earthquakes. Uh, uh, and that, you know, also on the human side, the building practices don't take that into account. Uh, let me just move into the presentation. And uh, so the seismic activity is very high. The recurrence of earthquakes historically has been, you know, that they get a major earthquake on the Richter scale 8 level. Uh, every 75 to 100 years, and the last one is 1934. So we are waiting for another earthquake, basically. But in the in the meantime, since 1934, the population has grown several fold. So we in the Kathmandu Valley have about 1.5 million people right now, and uh, obviously the earthquakes, the major earthquakes, has have taken place in in nobody's lifetime. So the awareness of building with earthquake resilience is not there, and uh, the projections for such an earthquake again is 40 to 95,000 deaths and, you know, about a million people homeless. Uh, so, like I said, I mean, this is one example. Uh, within the city, you know, properties are being subdivided. Uh, you know, so if, if there are four siblings, they'll, you know, take the little plot and turn it into four little plots. And you can see how the houses are made. The shop at the bottom and there's a four-story house uh, very, very, you know, shoddy construction. And the water tanks at the top add more weight. This is a very, very unstable structure and, you know, exactly the thing you don't want to do in earthquakes. Luckily, this is just the center of the city. Uh, what's happening, most of the population that is moving in from rural areas, and, you know, we say this is the urban millennium, so this, you know, also sort of relates to all the other major developing cities, are in the peri-urban areas, which you, where you don't have this kind of... Uh, uh, pressure on the area and the the current technique for building is not traditional people prefer brick and concrete and this is what it looks like if you move on uh, the technology that we sort of exploring there uh, is called straw bale and here are two examples you see the house so these are much larger bricks or blocks uh, but they can be used just like uh, bricks and you know, you can have two to three story buildings made with them without a problem. The earthquake resistant. And now comes, you know, where is the mitigation part of this? Uh, the beauty of straw bale is that it's a totally renewable uh, product. Unlike cement and bricks, which are very, very energy and water intensive in their uh, production and very highly polluting, uh, this is something that you make anyway. Rice is eaten all over South and Southeast Asia. The straw is produced. It's used in, you know, in, in minor sort of uses, but nothing uh, concrete or nothing big. Uh, and it is very low cost and available everywhere. So the first thing that we came across, I mean, there's obviously lack of awareness. Most of the new buildings in uh, Kathmandu, like many developing cities, are not earthquake proof. Uh, and the reason for that is that you know, people have not seen a major earthquake and they're not really aware that they need to do this. Most of the decisions on which material to use uh, for construction is based on, you know, economics. You know, what is the cheapest, strongest, most effective, available. So we thought if we didn't have the economics right, it is not possible to introduce this technology. So we, we took the model from Pakistan, took it to Kathmandu, and saw what would it take and how much would it cost. And we found out that the benefit-cost ratio of building a house with straw bale is two, two to one cost-benefit ratio. So it's very, very cheap to do that. 16% of the savings occur right away because the price of straw bale is much cheaper than bricks. The rest of the savings are in long term. So we took a 30-year, uh, you know, sort of a period. And that's the average time where you, you rebuild your, you know, housing stock not in the central cities, but on, at least in the very urban areas. And the rest of the savings all comes from the uh, savings in heating and uh, cooling of the, uh, of the structure. If you take the climate change predictions, you know, this increases even more. We have not actually put that in here. And basically, in a temperate climate like Kathmandu, even with the, you know, extreme heat peaks above 45 degrees, you would practically need no air conditioning which is something that is being heavily introduced into Kathmandu right now because of the heat island effect in the city. You know, more and more air conditioning is coming in, and because of the type of structures we use in the concrete and cement, 
you know, that's a major energy. So that is one of the biggest. Besides the production of cement and bricks, the, the heating and cooling over a long period of time is the, is the biggest mitigation sort of benefit of using this technology. One of the costs, major costs, is the wall area. You can make very thin structures, as you saw, uh, you know, in, in the picture I sh showed. So in areas, in mountain areas where, you know, land is at a premium, that is a major cost. So the biggest cost that we found was that instead of making that four to six inch wall that I showed you, you'll have to have at least 12 inches to have a sound structure made of straw built. And we did take the, uh, into account the price of that land and still came up with this ratio. Uh, we also played around with the social discount rate, uh, which usually in Western countries is around 3%. Uh, but we, we looked at 12% and 20%. And, you know, the, the results are still valid. Uh, one of the things that's very important in these calculations we found was not the, the social discount rate, but it's the price of straw. Straw doesn't have too many uses. It's, it's considered the worst or the least order uh, fodder because of its uh, nutritional values. But if you have start a rapid demand for straw, then, you know, the prices are bound to increase. And from our calculations, uh, we found that you know up to five times increase in price will still make the straw bill building uh, 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 very uh, economic. And also, uh, you need a lot of straw if you're going to have massive construction going on that straw bill. And uh, so we also calculated whether or not Kathmandu was producing uh, or Nepal was producing that much straw, and we found out that the valley itself is producing enough straw. Uh, to make all new buildings, and uh, we don't expect 100% adoption here, but if all new buildings were to be made out of straw, the annual production of straw is enough to feed that. Uh, and also this holds true for the rest of Nepal, and the entire country. Uh, the only issue would be that, you know, what would we have for substitutes for, you know, uh, for, for the uses that the straw is currently used for. So that's something one would have to look at into. Uh, so this was just for you know house for an individual household level making the decision to you know make out of a house out of a uh, different material, but then what we found and which is most important is the large scale macro benefits and that's where the medication comes in. If you see this picture, this is just outside Kathmandu. What's happening is because of the rapid urbanization, you see all the rice paddies are now being converted into brick kilns. So and the rice paddies are the best soil and also soil where the water is available. And you see that stream going by. So this area which you see is denuded used to be all paddy fields before. And one of the impacts, major impacts uh, of climate change in, in, uh, in such areas is food security. So you're basically reducing your you know, food production at the local level because transportation is very expensive. Uh, last time they had a big problem uh, in Kathmandu with food was not because of the production, but it was transportation. Uh, because when the oil prices went up two years back, it was very hard to transport uh, rice all the way up from, you know, from the coast through India into the mountains. So local production is extremely important for uh, food security. Secondly, like I said, uh, the brick kilns are highly, highly energy uh, consuming. Uh, all the, the major input into making a brick is heat and that's 70, 80 percent of its cost. The rest is soil which you can see that they take out of there and water. Uh, so that has had major effects on, uh, how, in, on the air quality in uh, Kathmandu and air pollution. You can feel it. I don't know how many of you have been there but uh, because of its geography, the air pollution is one of the most polluted cities now. Uh, the mor mortality rate from respiratory diseases is one in thousand. That is very, very, very high. So one in thousand people, the cause of death is of respiratory problems. For a single cause, that's a very, very high number. Uh, and also there's social issues with the way bricks are made because you need high investment. And uh, they have, you know, the competition is high. A lot of bonded and child labor is used. So just like the carpet industry, it's, it's, it's something, you know, that people have been struggling for a very long time. So if, if the straw, use is increased, we'll see reduction in these practices, you know, in pollution, in the social issues with it, and also the degradation and production of uh, local food. Uh, 
So this is just the beginning of introduction of a new technology and uh, of a transformative technology. Uh, when we tried to do a few uh, pilot buildings, it, we found it very difficult. Uh, although you know, in the in the Pakistan, it was introduced through experts uh, that came from abroad, but we tried to do this locally. Uh, one of the biggest problems we had was uh, that in this, you know, when people got really excited by this especially the experts. We had a PhD, uh, you know, uh, structural engineer working on the designs, but if you have never worked with a new material, it gets very, very difficult. So one of the lessons we learned was that instead of employing, you know, a very high-tech sort of a solution to this, we should get the masons and barely literate people who make these houses elsewhere. And they can do it, you know, correct the first time without any problems, and it's very cheap. Uh, whereas if you take a very high technological sort of a, uh, approach to it, it doesn't work. You know, we, we worked for a whole year and did work. And these guys can build a house in two weeks. And, you know, no errors. Uh, so basically that doesn't mean that we don't need technical knowledge because these houses are very resistant uh, to earthquakes, but they have to be designed properly. And even concrete and brick can be earthquake resistant. That makes it very expensive. But once again, the issue is also a technical issue that they have to be designed properly. Uh, you know, just because it's straw is not going to make it earthquake resistant. So that is one thing. The third thing is accepting the aesthetic preferences and modernity. When people move out of the villages, you know, they, they move out because they want better income, they want better life, better services. And a part of that is having to live in, you know, what they call a pakka or a solid house, which is, you know, brick and concrete and having a slab over your you know, or you had rather than a thatched roof. That is what people are moving away from, from the mud house. And this looks very much like an adobe house. So, you know, for having people to accept that this is fine, this is modern, and this will last long, and, you know, this will actually save you money, it, it, it will take some time. Uh, and we're seeing people, especially in Pakistan, at the, you know, both ends of the wealth spectrum ad adopting to this. It is either the very poor who can't just afford the brick, so they have no choice, or it's the very, very rich and aware who just do it more out of, you know, a, a preference uh, for, for aesthetic reason or for other reasons rather than, you know, uh, for, for mitigating uh, climate change effects. But anyway, what this demonstrates to us, and this is something we need to work into, it's just the beginning, is that, you know, this adaptation. Adaptation, all ecosystems adapt, people adapt. We are, I mean, if I give you an example right now, you know, the, the Bangkok temperature is not very, you know, comfortable and the humidity is not. We've adapted. We have air conditioning here. We've adapted so much that we can wear ties and suits here. I don't know if this is the best thing to do, but that's what we're doing right now. So there are elements of maladaptation here. The energy use is not necessary. For us to adapt, we sh should look into ways that we adapt where, you know, it also leads. So I would say good adaptation. Let me hypothesize that good adaptation should be adaptation that actually leads to mitigation. And I don't know that every solution can be win-win like that, but we should try very hard to look at such solutions and try to promote that. And uh, so uh, what can we do about that? Uh, what we're trying to do is, you know, training and tools for straw bailing. Uh, it's a very simple technology. The, even the construction and design, although nobody's done it before in Nepal, is actually much simpler than uh, doing concrete building and design and uh, bricks. Uh, we need, once again, earthquake-proof designs and construction techniques and techniques so they're built properly so the, you know, maintenance cost is low and you actually get the benefits of, you know, not having to heat and cool the house. Uh, one thing for adoption, we don't have much time. So the housing stock in, in, in Kathmandu area is not going to be changed very soon. But what we are trying to do is preposition for earthquake. So have straw built structures made in public buildings around the city. These would be schools and health centers. We're trying to promote that. And the reason we're doing that is first to people, for people to get used to it, to have more people trained. And also in the unfortunate event of an earthquake, these places can then act as shelters and food storage areas. And in that case, if they, these structures survive the earthquake, we think people will be much more keen to build these houses. As we've seen in Kashmir and Pakistan, that people are much op more open to this idea than in a place which has not experienced an earthquake. Uh, 
I mean, everybody who's seen a straw bale house, this is really surprising. It's making a straw bale house in, in Kashmir. Uh, because you walk into it and you realize it's so comfortable. I mean, in the heating, cooling bit. And plus, they know that it's, the roof is not going to fall on their head. Uh, so, you know, we should strive to look into, you know, measures and technologies, I would say, as a fun thing, which, you know, we're, we're not just dealing with adaptation, but we're also looking at mitigation in the long run. Um, I tried to run through this, and there are many, many details. You know, they said the devil is always in the detail, and what we've done here is very site-specific, and the calculations have to be site-specific. Spe There's a publication out. which just came out this morning, by the way. So if you see this picture, remember this picture, just on the way to the plenary, on the left side, there's a stall. And there are two other case studies on some other interventions. And all the details of this study are in there in a book. And you can, you know, you're most welcome to go and pick up a copy. And with that, I thank you. I think that was that was excellent. That was very much illustrative of the uh, the project level site specific intersection between adaptation and mitigation. And uh, as I said earlier, I wasn't sure how the mitigation side would come through, but it definitely did. It definitely did. So that was uh, that was good. And I have a bunch of questions, but that, this is not the time, and I'm sure others do as well. So perhaps with that, we can then move to our next our next panelist, who is. Ms. A. A. Tun, and she is an M&E monitoring and evaluation specialist uh, based in Myanmar with Mercy Corps. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is E. Tone. I'm the Design Monitoring and Evaluation Coordinator for the Mercy Corps Myanmar. I hope you enjoyed the presentation, and I believe we will have a very fruitful discussion today. Um, I'm going to present about the participatory monitoring and evaluations in climate change adaptation and mitigations. So, what is the role of participatory monitoring and evaluation in integrated mitigation and adaptation programs? Um, we have found that there are a lot of reasons why M&E is important in integrated mitigation and adaptation programs. One is to measure the effectiveness of integrated mitigation and adaptation results. Um, through participatory monitoring and evaluations, we can know do we achieve our objective or not. And to provide the critical process of learning what works and what does not work. And it's also to allow for any necessary changes with uncertainty of the climate change. Through participatory monitoring and evaluation, we can also develop the strategy to current and future climate change. And this also clearly demonstrates the synergies of the mitigation and adaptations, um, how adaptation contribute to mitigation and how mitigation contribute to the adaptations. It also can create a space for learning from the knowledge and experiences from the ground, from the local level. And this, oh, sorry. It's okay. um, this also can support the local ownership, which is one of the main factors for the sustainability. And it also promotes the sustainability by doing the participatory monitoring and evaluations. This can also create a space for dialogue to a learning implementations. And finally, this is also an evidence-based tool for the advocacy at the national, regional, and global level. Yeah, this is the role of the M&E in climate change adaptation and mitigation programs. And the next section is going to the monitoring and evaluations of the climate change adaptation and mitigation program, some of the tools available. And I believe um, specific approaches exists for establishing the mitigation and adaptation monitoring and evaluation system. 
but uh, how do we choose the right one which is context specific and which is more relevant to its objective. Um, the list would be much longer here, but I here highlight some of the tools that is more context specific to our program and project, which is the energy poverty survey. This is a measurement of tools that, to know about the household level and community levels, energy needs, and opportunity and challenges to meeting those needs. The periodic carbon emission test, a tool to measure the mitigation programs and projects, and also the periodic kitchen survey. This is a tool to measure the household level behavior chain, as well as to measure the reduction of the carbon emission. <coughs> and the periodic market survey, this is for the market-led adaptation and mitigation programs. Periodic aging stove kitchen test. Um, this is for the adaptation and mitigation program to measure the behavior change and also the carbon emission test. And the community mapping tools. This tool is to measure the social reforestation strategies. <coughs> and organizational capacity index tools. This tool is to measure the civil society-led adaptation and mitigation programs. And the monitoring and evaluation plan or the indicator plan, it can also apply in adaptation, mitigation, or the integrated adaptation and mitigation programs. Those are some of the available tools and some example tools in the adaptation and mitigation programs. Um, we also come up with some of the best practices of monitoring and evaluation system in climate change adaptation and mitigation programs. One of the best practices is to collect the baseline data to compare before and after the project so that we know the effectiveness of our program or projects and we can compare across what is the best strategy and what is the best program and projects. And another one is to collect the economic data, social data, and environmental data. By collecting the socioeconomic data, we can know the webbing of the people before and after the project. We can compare. And by collecting the environmental data, we can know that which context specific is influence the program or projects. And it's also to it's also very important to conduct the periodic survey and to have the robust database because there we have to record the detailed information of the climate change mitigation and adaptation program because of its nature. And also we should have the rigorous monitoring <coughs> as a bad practices that as the we are dealing with the uncertainty. Climate change is about the uncertainty. And Another bad practices is we should also promote the participatory monitoring and evaluations <coughs> because it promotes the local sustainability and local ownership. And also the organizational capacity self-assessment tool, it promotes the sustainability. <coughs> and finally, we should also disseminate the lesson learned of the documents that so that uh, we can learn, we can replicate, and we can modify, and we can adapt from the history. And also we have to publish the monitoring and evaluation, participatory monitoring and evaluation tools and methodology, so that we can learn from them, we can grow from them, and we can modify from them. To go through a few of challenges of monitoring and evaluations related to the climate adaptation and mitigation programs, then one of the big challenges is the capacity of the monitoring and evaluation, as the capacity often poses a harder to the monitoring and evaluations of mitigation and adaptation, as only a few people who handle both ME and climate expertise. 
And also it is very challenging to promote the participatory monitoring and evaluation because of the complex and dynamic nature of the mitigation and adaptation programs and its complex relationship with the idea of the sustainability and with poverty and poverty reductions. And it's often very challenging to communicate the scientific aspect of the climate change, scientific things to the community. And it's a very complex process of the socio-institutional learning. And we have found that it always take time and resources to conduct the periodic survey, periodic monitoring, <coughs> as well as keeping the detailed information as the carbon credit methodologies. Those are some of the challenges of the monitoring and evaluation related to the climate change adaptation and mitigation programs. As a way forward, um, we should learn from the change because the climate change is uncertainty, so that we should learn from change and we should adapt from change. And also we should recognize the local people who are capable of identifying and measuring their own indicators of change so that we can promote the sustainability. Thank you. That's all. Uh, now, thank you very much, Sayu I wonder if you could maybe provide a little bit of background, just very briefly, on the project, mm -hmm. because you might have noticed the, uh, the logo at the bottom. It is Sea Change, which I understand to be uh, community of practice for monitoring and evaluation around climate change impacts. So that's that's what this presentation is very much focused on. But what I also understand is the project and the initiative itself has to do with community forestry in areas that have been hit by uh, Cyclone Nargis. Um, I wonder if you could just provide us just a synopsis of what the project entails. Um, the project is about the market-led and civil society-led dissemination of the fuel-efficient stove together with the social reforestation strategy because when the cyclone nugget hit in Myanmar, people are vulnerable and they are facing the problem with the energy poverty so that we designed this program and project um, to promote the fuel-efficient stove use <coughs> and also to promote the social reforestation strategies um, by promoting the fuel efficient stove and by using the fuel efficient stove uh, the household can reduce the firewood consumption from 30% to 50%. And the reforestation, is it mangroves or is it uh, and for the reforestations, the, um, we are promoting and we are encouraging the mangrove plantation and also the flesh tree, fresh water tree plantations. Excellent. Thank you very much. And uh, again, we'll hold uh, questions until we've had our, our final and third uh, presentation, which is Mr. Raza Farooq, who is a senior project officer uh, with the Pakistan Resident Mission. Uh, and the Asian Development Bank. Just to find the presentation. <coughs> Please, Mr. Uh, thank you, Regan. Uh, good afternoon, uh, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, thank you very much for, uh, for uh, attending this session. Uh, my presentation is uh, uh, focused on uh, Indus Basin in Pakistan, uh, which is uh, uh, which is a uh, one of the biggest water basins, river basins in the world, and uh, it is uh, spread over about uh, little over a, a million square <coughs> kilometers of area. The basin comprises of five major rivers. Can you go to the next slide, please? Uh, the basin comprises of five major rivers which uh, all of those uh, flow uh, from India into, the, into Pakistan. Uh, this basin, uh, on average, yields about 150 billion cubic meters of water every year. 
and out of that 150 billion cubic meters, roughly 120 billion cubic meters is diverted to irrigate about 18 million hectares of land for agriculture production. <coughs> and that agriculture production basically contributes to about a quarter of the country's GDP. So you can, you can sense the importance of the basin in the in country's economy. Uh, <clears throat> when we talk of climate change, uh, uh, one of the <clears throat> most significant impacts of the climate change is basically <clears throat> the variation in the in the river flows. Uh, Indus Basin, uh, about 80 percent, more than 80 percent of the flows in the Indus Basin uh, are reserved from the glacier mat. The, the glaciers which are in the upper uh, HKH region, Himalayan uh, Krakram, Hindu Kush region. 80 percent of that 150 billion cubic meter roughly comes from the glacier mat and rest comes from the rainfalls. Uh, <clears throat> we are observing that uh, uh, at least during past five, six years uh, as a result of climate change there is significant variation in the river flows. Uh, one, uh, because of increase in the temperature changes in the upper regions, the rate of melting of glaciers is relatively higher, which uh, in turn uh, increases the river flows, particularly during the summer season. Second, the intensity of the rainfalls, the duration of the rainfalls, and the patterns of the rainfalls, there is significant variation. Uh, which again is affecting the river flows. When we talk of river flow, it is not only the volume of water uh, which is flowing, it is basically the, the uh, peak of the water which is very important. Uh, the duration during which a certain volume of water flows, that is very important uh, with respect to uh, 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 using the water for irrigation purposes. Plus, uh, uh, about one third of the installed electric generation capacity in the country is based on hydros in the Indus Basin. So, uh, both for irrigation as well as for for uh, uh, electricity generation, the impact of climate change on the river flows, the volume of water, the peak discharges, the duration of uh, flows, that has significant uh, impacts. Uh, <clears throat> next slide, please. Uh, the previous one. Previous one. Okay. Uh, this is one of the hydraulic structures we have. We have in the country. Uh, as I said, that we divert about 120 billion cubic meters of water for irrigation, and that is done through a network of uh, storage reservoirs, uh, barrages, which are the diversion structures, and canals, and these are all interlinked uh, systems. Uh, this is one of the, this was one of the structures called, uh, we call it headworks, which was uh, uh, there to divert about, uh, divert water for irrigating about 20,000 hectares on one of the small uh, rivers, which is tribut tributary of the main Indus River uh, on, the, on the western side. Uh, this structure uh, was very unlucky that in 2010, you might be knowing that Pakistan experienced one of the most devastating <coughs> floods of its history. And as a result of that, uh, this structure washed away. Can you go to the next one, please? So this is how it looks today. Uh, not today, I mean, it is being reconstructed, but immediately after the floods in 2010. So when we look at this picture, we, uh, there are many questions which come to the mind. Why this structure failed? It apparently it failed because it was it could not stand the hydrostatic pressure. It could not stand the volume of water which uh, reached here. It could not stand the flood peak which arrived. But the basic thing is that it was not designed for that that flood. When it was designed, whatever flood and hydrological analysis was done based on the historic data that did not forecast 
this much volume of water that did not forecast this much peak coming at this side. So it completely washed away. When it washed away, what, what, what is the impact of that? Impact is that that 20,000 hectares of uh, irrigated land that cannot get irrigation supplies until we reconstruct it. So if we reconstruct it, what should we what should we keep in our mind? How we should redesign it? So that's exactly where uh, where we we uh, we uh, try to bring in the impact of cli climate change. We try to uh, bring in, bring in the adaptation uh, bring in the adaptation to the design of the project so that. If tomorrow an uh, event of this magnitude or a higher magnitude comes, this structure should not be failing. So <clears throat> when we, when we uh, look at such examples, uh, there are few fundamental questions which come to our mind. Uh, are the investments which are made in the energy sector, in the, powers, in the, in the water sector, in the anticipation, are those investments safe? Uh, can you go to the next slide, please? Can projects sustain? Uh, can projects remain productive? I mean, we, a structure is washed away and the whole productivity downstream is affected. Can existing projects be made climate proof? And how future investments in the, in the basin could be made climate proof? So these are few fundamental questions which need to be answered when we plan our future investments investments not only in designing new projects, in constructing new projects, but also investments in rehabilitating, in uh, modernizing, in remodeling the existing infrastructure. So in order to uh, answer these questions, we need to know uh, whether we have enough uh, information on the downstream impacts of the climate change to incorporate uh, that in the designs, whether, do we, whether we have enough data which can help us in improved designs to withstand the impacts of climate change. So to answer, answer these questions, uh, we made uh, one attempt uh, uh, in the form of a small project where we thought that we should uh, look into whatever existing knowledge base country has. What are the gaps? What is, what is, what is existing? What is required? And how that gap which, between existing and the required can be filled? So uh, next slide, please. So a small project was uh, done uh, uh, between 2000, 2009 and 2010, uh, which was titled Glacial Met and Downstream Impact on interest dependent water resources. Uh, unfortunately, during the course of implementation, we came to uh, understand, we came to know that there is not enough information, data, research, or knowledge available within the country which can be basically used to uh, uh, make our future investments climate proof or make our existing infrastructure climate proof to avoid any such catastrophe in the future. So uh, based on that, uh, we thought that we should take a step, step further and try to find out what really should be done in a relatively short span of time to get the desired information, desired data, desired knowledge. Because the investments in, in, in the Indus Basin, even at present, various, uh, various players who are, who are involved in, the, in, in, in assisting Pakistan for, 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 uh, for uh, uh, developing their water and energy resources, uh, there are huge uh, investment plans in place and in implementation at the moment. Uh, in fact, only ADB at present is investing more than $1 billion in only water sector, more than $2 billion in the energy sector of the country, 
So it is very important that whatever we do, uh, we have already seen the impact of the climate change. I mean, uh, 2010 was one flood. Then we ha also had a rain-induced flood in parts of the country in 2011. So we have seen two extreme events in past two years. So it is very important for the policymakers in the government level, plus the uh, institutions who are supporting the government, the decision makers, and the designers. It is very important that they should be uh, taking quick action. So we thought that we should uh, we should plan something which can give us uh, quick results, which are of uh, uh, practical value. So we we thought that uh, in in this study a reference was made to uh, made to some relationship between the river flows and the temperature variations, because. The river flow is direct function of temperature variation in case of Indus Basin because if temperature increases, uh, melting rate is higher, so discharge flow is in the rivers is higher. So it's, it's a direct relationship between the temperature variations, which can be uh, seen. Uh, next slide, please. This is one, uh, one of the locations on the river Indus. And based on very rudimentary data, I mean, we do not have uh, sufficient data, we, ca we came to uh, a few conclusions that if temperature variation uh, is in the range of 0.03 to 0.15 degrees Celsius, what is going to be the impact on the flows? And you can see, for instance, for 0.15 degrees Celsius increase per year, uh, you can see that in about three decades, the, the discharge will all, almost double. And then it will slightly start reducing. So you can, you can say that in, in about six decades, the water volume will be either equal to the present one or almost double of the present one. And after six decades, it will start decreasing. So this gave, gives us a lot of uh, food for thought. So we, we thought that it is very important that we should, uh, we should uh, uh, try to develop correlations between temperature variations and the river flows. At present, uh, uh, unfortunately, whatever the climate change uh, knowledge is available globally or regionally, we, we don't find any such, any such uh, uh, example. So, so uh, we, we thought that we should uh, plan uh, uh, temperature versus river flow modeling. So that, next slide please. So that we can, we can uh, forecast river flows vis-a-vis -vis temperature variations in the HKS region, and we can, based on that, uh, uh, generate at least 50-year or 100-year river flow data series of all the rivers at various locations, and then whatever investments are in the pipeline, we. <coughs> Uh, uh, if those are designed, we improve the design. If those are not designed, then we design those based on the uh, future forecast. Second factor, which is rainfall. Again, rainfall, uh, ultimately, most of the rainfalls drain into the Indus Basin River. So it is, again, very important that rainfall should be correlated with the river flows. So rainfall runoff modeling, though there are many rainfall runoff models existing in the country, but keeping in view the changing variation the changing nature of uh, 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 rainfall patterns, which uh, 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 which is basically causing extremely high volume of water pouring down. During past two years, we have observed rainfalls in, 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 in at certain locations. Uh, the stations which used to receive uh, total volume of rainfall in two years, that volume was received in 24 hours during past two years. So you can imagine the, the intensity. So it, it is very important that first we should try to study the rain, changing rainfall patterns. The main uh, rainfall, rainfall system we have in Pakistan, that is monsoon, which originates from Bay of Bengal, and then it travels all the way northwest, uh, uh, and then striking with the mountains, it travels southward. <coughs> we have seen visible trends in the, in the pattern. Uh, it is gradually shifting towards south, its intensity is increasing, the volume of moisture it contains that is increasing. So the first 
the first uh, step is that we we try to uh, forecast the rainfall patterns in the future and then correlate those with the runouts so that at the end of the day we have another data series uh, uh, of river flow based on the rainfall the anticipated rainfalls so if we manage to do these two uh, do these two models uh, how can that help the policy makers, the decision makers, the designers. Next slide, please. Take the example of a hydropower project. When you work out the uh, uh, power potential of a site, you carry out hydrological studies based on the historic data. And you work out that this we can generate so many megawatt of power from this site. If we know that the current flow regime in the river is going to change because of uh, climate change, we can make more realistic estimates and we can design our project's capacity accordingly. Second, the safety features of the project. What is going to be the highest maximum peak in next 50 years? Now, at present, we are using historic data, but looking at the situation, that historic data may not give us uh, good results. As a result, that structure which I showed you that field. So if we can, we, if we can have uh, reliable forecasts, we can make reliable estimates of the peak maximum floods coming, and we can provide uh, required flood passing capacity in the structure. That is how it is so important for for hydropower projects. In case of storage res reservoirs. The capacity of the reservoir, the, the uh, configuration of the dams, that all depends, the life of the dam, that dep again depends on the hydrological studies. So if we know the reliable uh, flows for next, say, 50 years, the seasonal variations, winter, summer, monsoon, non-monsoon, if we have reliable data, we can have safe designs, we can be more sure of what we are going to produce, the availability of water for the purposes for which that reservoir is being constructed, the capacity of the reservoir to absorb floods. Most of the reservoirs we have are, are, are uh, multi-purpose reservoirs. They, they not, not, uh, not only provide water for irrigation, they also are used for flood mitigation. They absorb the flood peaks and they also generate electricity. So if it is very important that we, we, we should be knowing what, what is coming in our river if we want to have a, have a hydropower or a, or a uh, storage reservoir designed to not only meet the requirements of the future, but also to withstand, withstand uh, climate change induced calamities in the future. So. Uh, Sorry, this is in the Ferg, if we could uh, wrap up. This is, the this is the last slide. Great. <laughs> so uh, that is what in the plan, and we are actually moving in that direction. Hopefully, don't, two, three years down the road, we will be able to find answer to these questions. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. So we've had uh, a national level, national scale perspective on river flows and uh, the development of models to be able to fill knowledge gaps to enable uh, adaptive infrastructure development. <coughs> Thank you very much. Okay, I would like to open the floor now for questions. Actually, before I do that, I'd just like to ask, did our fourth panelist, Mr. Simon Henschel, ever join us? All right then, so we will entertain questions for the next 15, 20 minutes. Um, maybe we can take two or three from the floor, first of all. Sir, over there. Let's do it, uh, there's one microphone, so we'll do it. Three here, and then we'll move to the other side of the room first. Uh, thank you. Uh, my name is uh, Andreas. Uh, I come from the Indonesia, working on the 
Ministry for Marine Affairs and Fisheries. Uh, my specific uh, discussion is uh, for the second speakers. Uh, this is about the, our current project. We are now have a project, so-called uh, Blue Carbon Project, funded by our government, already run for the third years. Uh, and during our field work, we found some, uh, uh, we call it challenge uh, to the, our project. Uh, first, uh, we know that the importance of the coastal ecosystem, such as mangrove seagrass, as the carbon uh, mitigation in the, our earth. But on the other side, on, uh, we found that there is so many uh, converting of the mangrove ecosystem to the stream ponds, which is important for the fishermen in the local area. And, and the increasing of the uh, stream ponds uh, tend to increase uh, years by years. And, and now we found uh, difficulties in how to deal with this kind of condition because uh, in one side, stream ponds is important for uh, the fishermen, but for the global side, it's not good for the climate change. But we need to make a win-win solution to face this uh, problem, because this is, when we think uh, global, we cannot forget the local side. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Jeffrey Blate. I'm with WWF, based here in Bangkok. I work in the Mekong countries. Uh, thanks to all three panelists and, and to you for good facilitation. I have questions for everyone, but I'll try to keep it brief. I'm really sorry that I missed the beginning of your talk, and, and you probably covered this, but um, two really simple questions. One, um, you mentioned aesthetics, but is uh, susceptibility to fire uh, also an issue? Because I would imagine bricks withstand fire a lot better than, than straw bale. And then the other is you mentioned that it's a clear difference in, in how it feels inside one of these homes compared to inside a brick home. Do you have data to show like how much lower it is? Maybe you covered that already. No. Um, for you, Madam, um, I was really glad to see monitoring and evaluation covered in this session because it's really critical in terms of adaptive management. Uh, to, to know whether we're being effective with our strategies. So you emphasize participatory approaches, which is critical because of the need for sustainability. I work for an NGO. You know, we promote projects, we implement projects, but we can't stay usually beyond a three to five year period of time. So how, what is the motivation that you found works with the communities? Like what, how do you engage them to actually start doing the monitoring? And then specifically, what kinds of um, metrics do you have them actually measure? And then what are the feedback mechanisms to the project to be able to create that adaptive management loop, if you understand? Um, and then on that last presentation, thank you. Many questions for you, but, but is, you mentioned lack of knowledge or, or lack of good data at the national level. Was there any effort to look at the the historical variation in river flow and what the peak floods were over over history even before the the various irrigation works were put into place because I'm wondering you know you mentioned in six decades <laughs> flow will actually become lower than than it is now if I understood your graph correctly because I assume of melting of the glaciers, right? And so, um, you know, how how effective in the long term will any of these irrigation works be? And does Pakistan need to start thinking about alternative approaches to, you know, dealing with its water system, right? Maybe moving away from its current um, agricultural systems. Okay. Thanks. Thank you very much. And there is yeah, the gentleman behind you. Hello. Good morning. This is Aurobindo from India, Tripura Central University. I am basically an academician in the research institute and academic institute. Uh, I have a uh, query regarding the infrastructure uh, uh, setup for the climate proof resistance and all. The developing countries are facing the challenge of one-time investment. So whatever you are the, talking about the climate proof dam, road, buildings, and infrastructure is required on that.
but developing countries don't have that much of fund. Is there is any cost-effective technologies you are talking about or highlighting here, which can uh, as well as climate proof, as well as cost effective technology for the uh, dam or whatever the construction sector and all, or which can prove the longevity or sustainability factor as well as. Because developing countries having uh, money to do the things at a larger scale, different places, different many places, they are not able to afford and concentrate in one place or one dam only. So there is a huge demand. So I have a... Thank you very much. Okay, so maybe we will start with uh, A. A. Tung. Maybe you can respond to both, both of those questions. Um, for the first questions, for the mangrove plantations and also for the shrimp bombs, we are also facing the same problem in phase one. Now we are going to the phase two of the project. And now we are thinking to make the aquaculture mangrove together with the shrimp ponds. It said it is possible to make uh, that kind of aquaculture mangrove together with the shrimp ponds or mangrove together with a uh, freshwater tree together with the shrimp ponds. Yeah, I think it, it might help. <laughs> mm -hmm. And for the second questions, for the participatory monitoring and evaluations, it is totally challenges to promote the participatory monitoring and evaluations. And I have to I have to say that our project is not totally hundred percent the participatory monitoring and evaluations, but we try to promote the participatory monitoring and evaluations. Um, and I think one of the main thing is we have to permit the mistake. We have to permit mistake for the local people because, the, um, for example, if we ask them to do the design, and for sure <coughs> there will be a lot of mistake. So we have to permit mistake again and again. And it always takes time and resources. So we have to invest our time and resources for the participatory monitoring and evaluations. I think this is the main motivations. I hope that may answer. All right, thank you very much.